Well, uh -huh. So, okay, so my screen is here. Yeah, here, here, here. Okay, no, okay, no, okay, no, and several screens of okay. here. Okay, so here we are. Today's lecture is going to be brief. So now we'll go through the introduction and and look at plain stress not to be all. So that is that is the screen. That is my screen. Okay, uh I, I believe you have the handout I gave you, I sent on introduction to plans, uh, analysis of stress and strain. This is the last topic. Okay, it's not the last topic in strength of materials, but for this semester, it will be the last topic, analysis of stress and strain. And um, here, is, here, here is the content. Uh, first with the introduction, which I sent to you some time back, and then we look at what plane stress is. And then I will go ahead and look at principal stresses, maximum shear stress, and more circle for plane stress. Now, in all this, we are, uh, um, of course, with, with the topic of strength of materials is about stresses, 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 computing stresses, normal stress, shear stress. Um, uh, normal stress here, stress. Uh, that's all it's about. And then, now, of course, strains. Normal strains, shear strains. Okay. So we continue on that. So in the introduction, on the introduction, for the introduction, um, I I go through what we uh, what we covered earlier. What we covered earlier on analysis of no, normal and shear stresses on in beams and on cross sections generally yeah so previously we looked at this we looked at this and the previous topics we saw how to derive the a formula for computing the normal stress on on any cross section uh, and that cross section is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the member so we saw how we derived the formula, uh, which we call the flexure formula, and given by this, sigma x equals negative m y over i, the m being the the bending moment. So this is for beams, normal stresses in beams. By now, uh, um, I hope you haven't forgotten how to compute normal stresses in beams. And then we also went ahead to look at uh, how to compute shear stresses in beams. Uh, so we derived of these elements and then now we formed what we call the shear formula given by, by this expression here. Tau equals VQ over B times I, where V is the shear force on that cross section, and Q we said is the, the the moment, the first moment of the area above the level at which at which you want to compute the shear stress. The first moment of that area above the level. And, uh, at which you want to compute the shear the shear stress, and that moment is about the neutral axis, so is given by this expression. So this is what we called the shear formula. 
and uh, I, I hope you still know how to compute the shear stress. The shear stress given uh, given any loading condition on, on a beam. And then uh, in an earlier topic, you had looked at the very beginning at the very beginning of strength of materials. You saw how to compute the, the normal stresses the normal stresses due to this, uh, these simple loading cases, uh, tension and compression. Um, the normal stress is simply computed as the force, the applied force, either tensile or compressive, divided by the cross-sectional area. That is very basic. So, and these, these, these cases, uh, for these stresses are uh, in prismatic bars, prismatic bars, we have the, the, the load is applied longitudin longitudinally or oh, and the stresses are longitudinal. Uh, in other words, they are parallel to the longitudinal axis. So we do not have any stresses perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. The only stress there is, is the stress perpendicular to any cross section. So we have, no more stress throughout as the only stress we have, as the only stress existing in such prismatic bars. So in that case of stress is what we call uniaxial stress because it is along just uh, one axis, the longitudinal axis. On the, they are not, uh, uh, along other axis, the stresses are assumed to be zero. So this is the first, the basic, the most, the simplest state of stress that we have in strength of materials or in the in the analysis of stress as a whole topic, as a whole topic. Yeah. So and then you went ahead and then you, you saw how to compute the normal strains, the normal strains simply as the change in length, the ratio of the change in length to the original length. So this was, this, at the very, this is what you looked at at the very beginning. So now for this state of stress and strain, because now if for strain, we call this uniaxial strain, when you are dealing with prismatic bars again, uniaxial strain, then there are conditions that must be, that must be fulfilled. For this state, for you ask your straight, uh, for this state of strain to 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 apply. So first, if you remember Hooke's law, okay, um, the deformation, the deformation of the bar has to be the same or has to be uniform throughout change in length. If you take any cost, any any section of the bar, any portion of the bar, the change in length, the change in length within that portion should be the same as the change in length in another option. Yeah. So the deformation must should be uniform throughout the length of the bar or throughout the length of the member. So what 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 so for that to happen. We not uh, for that to happen, it means the bar, the bar has to be prismatic. Prismatic means uh, uniform cross section throughout, throughout the entire length. You have this the uniform cross section throughout the entire length. Or sometimes the bar can be made up of different cross sections. You are uh, over over one length. You have a constant section. And then over another length, another portion of the bar, you have maybe a larger cross section. So, but yeah, uh, so for each portion of the bar, each, each portion of the bar, these conditions apply as well. So the bar must be prismatic. And then the loads must be acting through the centroid of the cross section. Whether it is tensile or compressive, it should be acting through the, the, the center of the cross section. And of course, it should be homogeneous. The, 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 the bar should be, the material of the bar should be 
homogeneous, meaning you, you, it should be this made of the same material within the particular portion or within the particular length, length you're considering. So if it is steel, it should be steel throughout that length you're considering. And if it's concrete, it should be concrete throughout that length. That is what homogeneous uh, means. And then, then you looked at, you looked at uh, torsion, torsion, uh, you looked at torsion on uh, circular shafts, how to compute the torsion of stress, the torsion of shear stress uh, on, in circular shafts or shaft circular bars, bars of circular section. Um, so you, you derive that formula again, and it came to this uh, tau max uh, being given by uh, this formula, the torsional, torsional moment times the radius of the circular section divided by IP. What is IP, if you remember? If you can recall, what is IP in this formula? Yeah. Polar moment of inertia. Oh, yeah, the polar moment of inertia. Okay, yeah. So, and this formula is what you call the torsion formula. Yeah. So, and then uh, also, you saw how to compute the shear strain in a shaft using uh, this formula, the maximum shear strain denoted by gamma is given by the radius times this angle, the angle pi, divided by the length of the member of the bar. Okay, so all this applies for the case of pure shear. When it, for circular bars under uh, a shaft under torsion will, will give rise to the state of stress in such a shaft will be pure shear, pure shear. So, and, and uh, we saw how to denote pure shear using a stress element, uh, such as this one here. Sorry, this. So where we have pure shear, we do not have normal stresses. There are no normal stresses completely. And where we have the uniaxial stress, there is no shear. There are no shear stresses on such elements of uniaxial stress. So this uh, uniaxial stress and shear stress, pure shear, sorry, uniaxial stress and pure shear, those two states of stress are uh, specialized states of stress. They are not general, they are specialized. As you see here, your this, is, this applies for bars. Yeah, this is for a shaft. And then the previous one is for circular uh, prismatic bars. So they are not general. So this is what you looked at, okay? And I, I and I, I hope that you, you, you have done your revision, or you're doing your revision on what you covered before. Yeah. So to summarize all this, now the question is: Why do we need to study? Why do we need to study this topic of analysis of stress and strain? Yeah. Why we need to study it? Uh, uh, the first reason is that, as you as you as you have noted in the previous topics, we have been computing stresses, normal stress, uh, shear, shear stress, shear strain. But those stresses, the formulas derived are for stress, normal stresses, stresses acting perpendicular to the cross section. Okay, so we have the cross section is. Uh, uh, is normal or perpendicular to the axis of the member, and then we will compute either the normal stress on that section or the shear stress on that section. This is for beams, and and also for bars. normal stress and also this strain here 
is a normal strain. So, and of course, you know how to compute the maximum normal stress. Uh, you know how to determine the, to compute the maximum normal stress for beams and also the maximum shear stress. But the max, those, those maximum values you obtain from the flexure formula and the shear formula may not be the largest values of the stresses in the at, at a particular point. They may not be the largest. They are based on normal cross sections. So you cannot use such stresses for for, uh, for 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 design, you need to investigate further. There might be there might be other cross sections on which the normal stresses are larger than those you obtain from these uh, from 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 uh, the, the shear formula or the flexure formula here. So you need to investigate further. Where on where do we hide? Where on which on which planes do we have? the largest normal stresses, the largest shear stresses, and what is the inclination of those, those planes. So that is, that's, uh, that's, that's the reason why we need, you need to study, you need to understand this analysis of stress and strain. Uh -huh. And of course, those maximum stresses, the maximum stress values may occur on inclined cross sections instead of the normal cross section that you're used to so so you you want to know you want to know the stresses on such inclined sections and then and then with that you have an uh, you have uh, a holistic uh, investigation uh, uh, you have a bigger picture of the state the states of stress in at a particular point so and also I mentioned that the uniaxial, the uniaxial stress and pure shear are specialized states of stress. So in analysis of stress and strain, we have to investigate, we need to compute stresses on inclined planes. And in that case, the state of stress is, is, uh, is general, it's not only uniaxial, it's not just pure shear, it is a general state of stress, which, which are referred to as plane stress. Okay. The uh, plane stress itself is also a simplified state of stress. The, the general state of stress is a three-dimensional stress where you have stresses in all directions that if you can imagine, imagine uh, a cube. Simply, it's a simplification. Uh, depend, uh, considering the kind of problems you have at hand, yeah, there are some there are some problems that require uh, in which we apply plane stress. To, uh, we apply the concept of plane stress to determine the the maximum stresses at a particular point. So this is all for the introduction the introduction or the review okay uh -huh. so any questions on this anything that is not clear none okay i see a hand uh natukunda i see your hand up. Yeah. yes Wow. Yes, for the part of shear stress. Yes. I do not understand what you mean. Part of shear stress. Let me go back. Here. Yeah. Yes, yes, I do not understand what you meant by above the neutral axis. Above the 
uh, neutral axis. As in uh, computing, the, the, uh, your question, I, I take it to be computing the, the, the value Q, not so. Yes. Okay, how to compute Q? Yeah, so I said that previously when we were deriving this formula, we have, we want to compute the shear stress, the shear stress. This tau, if you look at this, uh, this diagram here, this portion of the, of the beam. This, this is not the cross section, okay? This one here. We want to compute the shear stress at a certain level, at a certain height above the neutral axis. That height is Y1, Y1. We want to compute the shear stress at that level. So we derive the formula uh, and then we came up with this. BQ over BI. And then we said that the Q, Q is the moment of, the first moment of the area above, uh, if I may use the shading tool, the area above, we use this, it's not, yeah. So Q is the first moment of the area, this area here, this area, the area above the level at which you you desire to compute the shear stress okay you're computing the shear you want to compute the shear stress at a, at a level uh a distance y1 from the neutral axis so the area from that level upwards from that level up to the edge of the beam the top of the the the, the, the section is what you consider when you're computing this moment Q, this moment, the value of Q. So you have to get the first moment of this area about, it has to be about the neutral axis. Okay, it's about the neutral axis. And that area is denoted by this element, the A. The A. So we take the moment of that area, the A, about the neutral axis, the distance of the centroid of the area, the A, from the neutral axis, we denoted it by y, this y here. Okay. So that is how you compute the q, the value of q, the value of q. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, any other question? Yes, um, what's the difference between normal and shear stress? Normal is perpendicular. Uh, normal stress is here. Uh, um, first of all, let me begin from a prismatic bar. Uh, do you get it clearly here? The normal stress. Normal means the stress acting on uh, a normal section, a normal cross section, a section that is perpendicular to the axis at right angles, the axis of the longitudinal axis of the beam, okay? So uh, if you see in this uh, this diagram here, um, if you don't consider, you cut, cut through this bar, this section, take section X, X, and then you have this. So you have this space there, this area, which is A, because it's prismatic, so it's uniform throughout. So the stress you get, the stress you get from, uh, from uh, by computing the stress you get from that is the normal stress, the, simply the force force over that area, the cross sectional area. That is the normal stress perpendicular to the cross section. The stress that is perpendicular to the cross section is what the normal stress means. Now, shear stress is shear stress is shear stress acts along its slides. Remember, to shear is to slide, sliding first. Uh, again, there's two layers sliding, two layers sliding against each other. That is what shearing is. So when you have two layers in contact with each other, like you put your hands together and then you try to slide, slide your hands past each other. 
okay between the two between your two hands between your two hands if you try to slide means you're applying a certain force so there is a certain there's a force that is that will uh be responsible for that sliding causing that effect of sliding past uh, between the two layers that force is what we call the shear force <clears throat> and because there's that force that force induces what we call shear stress so the shear stress the shear force acts just on the surface just slides on the surface or on the cross section and also that is how the shear stress uh, uh, that is how the shear stress acts it slides along the, the surface the cross section it is not normal to the cross section it just slides along like that okay so so uh and also uh here when we're deriving when we're deriving this formula okay thank you yeah you're welcome when we're deriving this formula we made use of what we call complementary shear stress complementary shear stress uh, meaning that if we know the shear stresses on one on one if we know the shear stress on one face of an element uh, okay like that if this is the shear force the shear stress on one face of the element uh, uh, this element must be in equilibrium. So it means on the opposite face, there must be an equal but opposite, opposite shear stress. Okay, on the opposite face, equal but opposite, equal magnitude, opposite, opposite direction, like that. To maintain uh, equilibrium in the vertical direction, and also because this entire element has to be in equilibrium if we just left if it is just if we just if we don't if we just left it like this there would be it would distort you would have these two two forces on the opposite faces which would cause the element to distort one 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 face moves upward the the, the opposite face moves downwards uh, and uh, to, so to, to maintain equilibrium, there must be other stresses, another pair of stresses in the other faces, in the top and bottom faces, like that. So there must be other, other stresses. So you have to indicate, just like we have here, for pure shear, just like I indicated, just like we have here, for pure shear. So, so that is so. So, any other question? Do we need to know calculations concerning Moore's circle? Do we need to know calculations concerning Moore's circle? Yes, yes, you need to know. Yes, you need to know. You need to know. That, that is now, that will come later. No, see that number. That number five here yeah, on the content list okay so meaning you can set a question about uh principal stresses and more circle bit yeah more circle as we can as we shall see more circle is simply uh there are two ways to compute to do analysis of stress and strain there are two two ways we have the analytical approach which makes use of these formulas, the formulas we are to derive, analytical approach, which makes use of the formulas, and then the graphical approach, which uses, which makes use of Moore's circle. Moore's circle is a graphical, is a graphical method for computing, computing stresses at a given point. <laughs> Just a graphical method. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's useful to know it. Okay, so thank first, Yeah, so first we will look at the analytical method and then we'll, uh, we'll conclude by looking at more circle. Yeah, more circle. Any other question? 
Any other question? No. No. Okay. So I'll proceed. So that is all for the introduction. Uh -huh. So now we proceed on to the next, which is which is uh, um, plain stress. Okay, plain stress. So, what is plain stress? Okay, so in plain stress, first we look at we we'll see what plain stress is, and there are notations and sign conventions, which we we shall learn. And then we'll see how to compute stresses on an inclined section and how uh, the transformation equations for plane stress. And, and of course, some, uh, some special cases of plane stress. Yeah. Mm. So, what is plane stress? Now, first, before we talk about plane stress, we have to know that at any given point, at any given point on a member, at any given uh -huh. uh, we have, uh, we can represent the state of stress by a three dimensional element. Three dimensional element. So that if you can normally uh, uh, represent it as a cube, as a cube with stresses acting on all the places. You have, we have normal stresses. And she has places on each of the each of the eight faces of the cube. So this space here will give rise to nine stress components. Nine stress components. We have three normal stresses, three normal stresses. Uh, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and three. Uh, one, two. No, this should be six, not nine. Six unique, okay? These are six unique states of stress. Okay. Uh, six unique states of stress. So with sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z, and then the shear stresses. Uh, I will, we shall see how, how what is what is what is substrate represent later on. Yeah. So this set of stress is the general the general set of stress at any given point. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes there are cases, there are practical situations where we do not, where we we where there are on some faces of the element, we have zero stresses in some directions. Yeah, like if we take the z axis. And the stresses on that axis, the sigma z is zero, and also tau z x tau y z tau z x tau y z becomes zero. So that leaves us with with this state of stress here. Uh, this one, this case here. So in that case, that becomes plain stress. Plain stress means a state of stress where all the stresses on that element are uh in one in the same plane um okay so oh i'm going to change this so um i have some video i want i need to show you is a video a youtube video i'll share the link with you so you can watch it later should i put it here uh introduction to plane stress here let me share it. I'll send you. I'll share the link, and then you can watch it later on. But for now, let me let me share that video here. Oh, oh sorry. Okay, watch this video here. 
analyzing solid mechanics problems in three dimensions. Analyzing solid mechanics problems in three dimensions can be really hard work, and it can get very complicated very fast. Fortunately, in a lot of cases, there are some simplifications we can use to reduce a three dimensional problem to a two dimensional one, making it much easier to solve. The two main simplifications which are frequently used in solid mechanics are the plane stress and plane strain conditions. In this video, we're going to take a look at plane stress. So what does plane stress mean? The component is said to be in a condition of plane stress when all the stresses acting on it are on the same plane. A surprising number of common engineering problems can be approximated for plane stress conditions. It is most relevant for the analysis of thin components. Let's take a look at an example. To determine whether we could model this perforated plate using plane stress assumptions, we need to see whether it is reasonable to assume that all stresses are acting in the same plane. All of the loads are applied in the same plane, the xy plane, so that's a good start. But having all loads acting in the same plane is not enough for the plane stress condition to be met, as we could still have stresses in the z direction. This is where the thickness of the plate comes in. We know that normal and shear stresses at a free surface are always zero. This means that the stresses on the top and bottom faces of the plate must be zero. And because this plate is very thin, there can't be much variation in stress through the plate thickness, meaning that the stresses in the z direction will be close to zero all the way through the plate. Because the only non zero stresses are acting in the xy plane, the condition of plane stress applies. Of course, in reality, the stresses in the z direction are unlikely to be exactly zero. Deciding whether a plane stress condition is applicable will always require a degree of engineering judgment. Why is the plane stress assumption useful? We can answer by taking a look at a stress element in our perforated plate. The stresses at a single point are defined by six different stress components three normal stresses and three shear stresses. For plane stress conditions, sigma z, tau xz, and tau yz are equal to zero. This means that the six components defining the stress at a point are reduced to just three components, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. This is a two-dimensional problem, which will be much easier to solve. The stress tensor for a three-dimensional case is a nine by nine matrix. But if we consider plane stress conditions, it is reduced to a much more manageable two by two matrix. Let's look at two more examples of situations where it might be appropriate to assume plane stress conditions. Pressure vessels can sometimes be modeled using plane stress assumptions. The pressure load generates fixed stresses, which are oriented around the circumference of the vessel, and axial stresses. If the vessel wall is thin compared to its diameter, radial stresses will be close to zero, and plane stress conditions will be applicable. The teeth of a spur gear can also sometimes be modeled using plane stress conditions if the width of the gear is narrow enough. So, to summarize, plane stress is a simplification which can be used to turn a three dimensional solid mechanics problem into a simpler two dimensional one by assuming that the stresses in one direction are equal to zero. It is normally applicable to thin structures which are loaded in a single plane. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more engineering videos. Okay, that's the video. Okay, how uh, uh, I hope you you pick something from that video. No, I don't see the application of plane stress in that shaft there. You don't see the application of plane stress in that shaft? Yeah, the one on the screen. 
I'll get to that question in a moment. Okay. Uh, there is one point that I, I, I need to highlight or to. I need to, I need, I need to watch again. We need us. I need us to watch again. We are going to watch, but we don't even hear the person speaking. Sorry. We don't hear the. I think is. Okay, now were you getting it? Was it clear or not? The volume is so low. The volume. No. The audio was not clear. Not clear at all. How about now? Different stress components. Three normal stresses and three shear stresses. For plain stress conditions, sigma z, tau xz, and tau yz are equal to zero. This means. Is that clear enough? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Yeah, it's a bit. Okay, so uh, you uh, uh, would you like to see watch it again from the beginning, just about yes. Okay. Mechanics problems in three dimensions can be analyzing solid mechanics problems in three dimensions can be really hard work, and it can get very complicated very fast. Fortunately, in a lot of cases, there are some simplifications we can use to reduce a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional one, making it much easier to solve. The two main simplifications, which are frequently used in solid mechanics, are the plane stress and strain conditions. In this video, we're going to take a look at plane stress. So what does plane stress mean? A component is said to be in a condition of plane stress when all the stresses acting on it are in the same plane. A surprising number of common engineering problems can be approximated to plane stress conditions. It is most relevant for the analysis of thin components. Let's take a look at an example. Mm -hmm. To determine if the model is operated plate using plane stress assumptions, we need to see whether it is reasonable to assume that all stresses are acting in the same plane. All of the loads are applied in the same plane, the XY plane, so that's a good start. But having all loads acting in the same plane is not enough for the plane stress condition to be met, as we could still have stresses in the z direction. This is where the thickness of the plate comes into it. We know that normal and shear stresses at a free surface are always zero. This means that the stresses on the top and bottom faces of the plate must be zero. And because this plate is very thin, there can't be much variation in stress through the plate's thickness, meaning that the stresses in the z direction will be close to zero all the way through the plate. Because the only non-zero stresses are acting in the x-y plane, a condition of plane stress applies. Of course, in reality, the stresses in the z direction are unlikely to be exactly zero. Deciding whether a plane stress condition is applicable will always require a degree of engineering judgment. Why is the plane stress assumption useful? We can answer by taking a look at a stress element in our perforated plate. The stresses at a single point are defined by six different stress components. Three normal stresses and three shear stresses. For plane stress conditions, sigma z, tau xz, and tau yz are equal to zero. This means that the six components defining the stress at a point are reduced to just three components, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. This is a two-dimensional problem, which will be much easier to solve. The stress tensor for a three-dimensional case is a nine-by-nine nine matrix, but if we consider plane stress conditions, it is reduced to a much more manageable two-by-two two matrix. Let's look at two more examples of situations where it might be appropriate to assume plane stress conditions. Pressure vessels can sometimes be modeled using plane stress assumptions. 
Pressure load generates hoop stresses, which are oriented around the circumference of the vessel, and axial stresses. If the vessel wall is thin compared to its diameter, radial stresses will be close to zero, and plane stress conditions will be applicable. The teeth of a spur gear can also sometimes be modeled using plane stress conditions, if the width of the gear is narrow enough. So, to summarize, plane stress is a simplification which can be used to turn a three-dimensional solid mechanics problem into a simpler two-dimensional one by assuming that the stresses in one direction are equal to zero. It is normally applicable for thin structures which are loaded in a single plane. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more engineering videos. Analyzing solid mechanics problems in three dimensions. Okay. I hope that was much better. Yes, that was better. Yes. There's a certain point, there's something that didn't seem quite clear in this video. Defined by six different stress components, three normal stresses, and three shear stresses at an element in our perforated plate. The stresses at a single point are defined by stress components, three normal stresses and conditions sigma z, tau xz, and tau yz are equal to zero. This means that the six components defining the stress at a point are reduced to just three components, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. Okay. This is a two-dimensional. So this is what this is how a 3D a 3D uh, state of stress is reduced to a two-dimensional plane stress. Okay, by uh, having uh, if stresses on some of the faces are zero, then they, they cancel out as indicated in that in the video. So by this this particular point is something that I did not that I seem that did not seem quite Right. Answer by taking a look at a stress element in our perforated plate. Okay. Let me study. Of course, in reality, the stress because the only non-zero stresses are acting in the XY plane, a condition of plane stress applies. Of course, in reality, the stresses in the Z direction are unlikely to be exactly zero. Deciding whether a plane stress condition is applicable will always require a degree of engineering judgment. Why is the plane stress assumption useful? We can answer by taking a look at a stress element in our perforated plane. The stresses at a single point are defined by six different stress components, three normal stresses and three shear stresses. For plane stress conditions, sigma z, tau xz, and tau yz are equal to zero. This means that the six components defining the stress at a point are reduced to just three components, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. This is a two-dimensional problem, which will be much easier to solve. The stress tensor for a three-dimensional case is a nine by nine matrix. Okay, now this is the point. Okay. This part here is, is not quite clear because it says the stress tensor for three dimensional uh, element is a nine by nine matrix. But this this is not a nine by nine matrix, is it? No, it's not. It's a three by three. Yeah, it's, I think that was this, uh, the, uh, he, he, he should have, it should it should be three by three matrix. But there are, there are nine stress components. There are nine stress components, but they, you can put them in a matrix, and it's a three by three matrix. Okay. So why why they become six is because uh, some of them two so like if you tau x y and tau y x, these are the same. Okay, tau x y and tau y x. Uh, previously, in one of the previous, uh, the past lectures we had, uh, we showed that 
uh, on a stress element, like the, the element of pure shear, pure shear, stress element with uh, shear stresses on all the faces. We saw that tau xy is equal to tau yx. These two are equal. And also tau xz is equal to tau zx. And tau yz equals tau zy. So that the, so this reduces to six unique stress comp uh, stress components. So there are. Sir, could you please show us on the stress element? Sorry. Could you please demonstrate this on the stress element? On the stress element. <coughs> okay. uh, uh, let me use. You see this three-dimensional element, okay? So in total, there are nine. There are nine. If you just count the, each of these elements, there are nine on each of these faces, okay? Each of these three faces. This first element on each face gives you a total of nine. Nine stress elements. Uh, some elements are not unique especially the shear stress elements, the shear elements, these ones here, okay? The shear elements are not unique. Like if we went back to the slide, the slide here, let me go back to the slide. Make sure, make sure. The slide here. Okay, this is the element now. Go back to the previous slide of pure shear. Here, for the case of pure shear, we know that uh, uh, the shear stress of tau xy is equal to tau yx for equilibrium. Yeah. For equilibrium, tau xy is equal to tau uh, yx, and also tau xz in the same way, tau x xz tau zx. Okay, so where you have tau tau x. Where you have tau tau xy and tau yx components, nine space components. This tau xy and tau yx are the same. They have the same value. And also, wherever you have shear stresses, there's only one unique shear, shear stress. But they are equal but opposite. Equal but opposite. So tau xy is equal to tau yx but opposite. So what is here? Just uh, uh, the, the, the 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 values of the, the numerical values of this. Uh, so this reduces, if you just take, so you want to, you have three normal stresses and one shear stress, uh, one tau xy, and then tau yz and tau, tau, tau zx. So that's how it comes to six unique, six unique, uh, unique elements here. Here, 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 here. Okay. okay, so don't uh, don't worry so much about that, the matrix, we are not going to look at that for now. We are not going to be, look, we are not going to look at three dimensional stress, we'll be looking at two dimensional stress. So in the video, these six places we used to, Two-dimensional spread. Uh, when we have the, the normal spread, sigma, sigma, sigma Z, the normal spread, sigma Z zero. If sigma Z is zero, it's the component. Sigma Z is zero. Whatever the component. Hello, I did. Uh, that wasn't clear. Could you could you please uh, say that again? Hello.
Hello. Saying that you are unclear. I, I, I can't hear you properly. Okay, how about now? Now I can, but when you're explaining, I didn't pick anything. Okay. Okay. Now, let me show you another video. Okay. Another video is here. Okay. Analyzing solid mechanics problems in three dimensions can be really hard work. Yeah. Explain the three dimensional stress tensor. In order to understand what a three dimensional stress tensor is, consider an arbitrary body subjected to different forces. Due to these forces, stresses get We increased. can't see that screen of the video. All the three dimensions. Can you please share your screen? Okay. Let us consider an infinitesimal element which shows the state of stress. Can you see this now? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay. Claim the three dimensional stress test. Now, the term tensor here is a little, it's a mathematical term, just like you have matrix, not just like you have vector, vector. Uh, uh, a tensor is, a, is another physical term, but uh, we are not going to talk so much about it. Uh, a tensor is, a, is an advanced subject, so don't, don't worry so much about it. For now, it is, it is an advanced subject in math itself and also advanced mechanics. Just just uh, you, you just illustrate the concept of uh, states of stress, three-dimensional states of stress, and how it reduces to two-dimensional states of stress, and what kind of the kind of uh, uh, structures or practical practical structures in which uh, which give rise to three uh, plane stress. So this is what this is what you should take from this video. Okay. Explain the three dimensional stress tensor. In order to understand what a three dimensional tensor is, consider an arbitrary body subjected to different forces. Stresses get induced in the body. Let us consider an infinitesimal stress element which shows the state of stress at a point in the given stress body. Where the stress element is in equilibrium with spaces in the three dimensions on the positive phase. And that to the negative direction is called negative phase. Now the stress element is subjected to three different normal stresses and six different shear stresses. Thus, to define stress at any point in a three-dimensional space, we require nine components of stresses, which can be represented in the form of a multi-dimensional array. Such array is termed as a three-dimensional stress tensor. Thus, a three-dimensional stress tensor is a multi-dimensional array of nine stress components. Now let's discuss about the nomenclature and sign convention for these stress components. Let's start with normal stress. It has a subscript that identifies the base on which the stress acts. For example, normal stress sigma x is acting on the x phase of the element. And the normal stress, sigma z, is acting on the z phase of the element. The sign convention for normal stress is very simple. Tensile stress is taken as positive, while compressive stress is taken as negative. Now let us discuss about the nomenclature and sign convention for shear stress. 
has two subscripts, which the stress at. While subscript two identifies stress on that face of the element. Now x y is acting on my direction. And a shear stress tau zx is acting on the z face of the element and in the x direction. Shear stress is positive when it acts in the positive phase and positive direction of an axis. It is also positive when it acts in the negative phase and negative direction of an axis. Thus, in this given stress element, all the shear stress components are positive. And a shear stress is negative when it acts in the positive phase and in the negative direction of an axis. It is also negative when it acts in the negative phase and positive direction of an axis. Related terms are Uh, okay. Okay. So that that video basically just summarizes what uh, what I, I intended to cover, but uh, uh, it has not uh, it has not talked about. Some structures where we can use half plane stress assumption applied. Okay. Uh, let me uh, check. Um, excuse me. Yes. Yes. Hello. Could you help explain when shear stress is positive and when it's negative? I haven't really understood. Okay, I'll get to that. That one was quite ahead. That's where we're heading. Okay. I'll get to that. Okay. There's something. Uh huh. Okay, now this, 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 I needed you to see a practical structure. Okay, something here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so just watch you complete it's 10 minutes long. You may not go in the entire 10 minutes. Just oh. point one stress transformation equations. <laughs> In this unit, we will focus on the following course outcome. Demonstrate the ability to transform stress and strain and find principal, normal, and shear stresses. In this lesson, we will focus on the following three outcomes. First, transform stress using the transformation equations. Second, determine the principal stresses using the equations. And third, determine the maximum in-plane shear stress also using equation now let's begin our discussion of the trend okay it is uh, it's called, this is a pressure vessel okay it can contain a, a gas uh gas or a liquid storage tank okay so in that case there are no most cases there are no external forces applied on the surface on the surface the surface is right in most cases free of external loads let's say inside there is a pressure of 100 pounds per square inch and the wall thickness is 0.125 inches and the internal radius is 24 inches we can calculate the hoop stress don't worry about this calculation just 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 get the 
uh, just get the application or, or uh, don't worry about the calculation for now. In the tank with this equation, we can evaluate 19.2 KSI. We can also calculate the axial stress or the longitudinal stress in this direction. And that's the value of 9.6 KSI. A stress element can be used to show the stresses that are occurring in the tank wall. Instead of drawing a volume element or a cube to represent the material, I've shown a simple square. That's because our stresses are plane stresses, which means they occur in the plane of the tank wall. Now, the way I've drawn my stress element is important. I've aligned the edges of the element to be in the direction of the longitudinal stress and the circumferential stress. So you see, this stress element here is coming from the surface. Just you pick just a small segment of this tank. Yeah. So that's what this kind, this step, this uh, element represents. Extra a small element, and then the steps of stress. Now, in the axis perpendicular to the plane of this uh, of this element, your direction. There are no stresses. That is the, the z direction. There are no stresses. That's why we represent this as we are representing only the x stresses along the x and along the y, along the x horizontal and, and along the y horizontal. The stresses along in the z direction are are, are zero. So that is the, that is the concept behind plane stress, and this is common for structures which are which are very thin walls, thin uh, thin walls like such tanks. The thickness is very small. It's very small, and uh, there are no external loads applied at cert at a certain point of it, at the point at which you're investigating the stress. So maybe let me now and these arrows uh, represent the stresses in the axial and circumferential directions. And note so these stresses are in the axial. This is along the axis of this structure, this pressure vessel, and then this vertical one is along the uh, the it is called the uh, uh, the radio. No, along the circumference, this one, the vertical, the 19.2 KSI is along the circumference, along the circumference of the, 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 the vessel. So along the um, the radius of the, along the radius, the stress is zero. That is what, that would be the sigma Z, which you can visualize, visualize circular section, and then you have the radius of the circle and a uh, stress along the radius uh, would be zero. That, that would be the sigma z. Uh, okay. Just that the element is in static equilibrium. Also notice that no shear stress appears on this element. Now, this one is a general state. This one is a specialized state of plane stress because we don't have shear stress. Generally, there would be shear stresses. There would be shear stresses along. Uh, at a particular at some point unless you compute them to be to be zero okay i mean there is no shear stress in the tank wall well no there is shear stress there just the way we've drawn this element and the equations we have to calculate stresses are only for these directions so how do we find what the shear stress is well we can use our stress transformation equations for plane stress to do that now here is the volume element. When I have rotated theta, which is zero degree. We are going to the calculations, and that is what we should we have. We are, that's what we shall look at shortly after. So back to the slide. So um the, the case of plane stress occurs in uh like that pressure vessels uh, or a tank with a very uh, a wall that are very thick the thickness of the, the 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 tank wall of the pressure vessel in that video is always small compared to the other dimensions and and also when we are dealing with analyzing a a, a plate a plate there are structures called thin wall structures they have a very small thickness compared to compared to the other dimensions, like a tube, if you can imagine a tube, 
uh, or, or a tube of rectangular cross section, a hollow tube. The thickness is very small, but the length and the width and the height are very large. So in the direction of the thickness, in the direction of the thickness, the stresses are, uh, are very small. They are not zero, but they are because they are very small compared to uh, the stresses in the other directions, they are negligible. Hence, they can be approximated as zero. That's what, and, and the result will be the case of the plane stress because that axis along which we have negligible stresses, uh, if, uh, we, we don't, you, 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 we don't represent it. Okay. We only focus on the axis on which we have the large stresses. And then the axis, such as the Z axis here, with those small stresses, uh, we assume those stresses to be zero. So that gives rise to uh, the state of stress called plane stress. So it is just an assumed state of stress for simplifying the solution, the analysis of the stresses at a particular point. Okay, so in that case, if we consider the Z phase to be free of any stresses, then S, this, is, this should have been sigma Z, sigma Z here, uh, sigma Z will be the same as tau Z X, the same as tau Z Y, which should be zero. Uh, I not yet edited that. Okay, which would be zero. So what, wherever you have a Z in a subscript, that stress would be zero. So you, so F, the problem reduces to the set of three stress components, the sigma X, sigma Y, and then tau X, Y, like that, like this, okay? So this is what it reduces to. So we shall be dealing with this state of stress here, plane stress, this simplified two-dimensional state of stress. So what we shall be obtaining, what is the maximum stress? What is, what is the stress on an inclined section? It is C. So this is what we'll be dealing with. Okay. So then, and also this, these are some, uh, uh, this is a pressure vessel in which could be a pressure vessel or a, a tube, a tube, a rectangular tube, a hollow tube with a, a small a small thickness, and then uh, the width, length, and height are large. So that the state of stress in that rectangle. Sometimes that that hollow section may be filled with concrete. It could be a circular section, circular metal plate, a, sorry, circular section but with, uh, with hollow section with concrete filled in the hollow to form a structural member that may be required. So the state of stress in that case would be plain stress. So this is how you would represent that state of stress in, within the in, an element of the, the tube. Okay, so the video I showed you, uh, the one the one link is here. One link is here. I'll add the, the link for the, for the second one also. And also there's another one, but uh, we don't have much time. I'll just give you the link and you can watch this. Okay, so, so now, before we go further, we have to get use the notation and the sign convention. The notation and sign convention. What does tau x y mean? What what does the x represent? What does the y represent? When you say sigma x, what does it mean? Just as, as it was explained in the video. Now, first the notation for for the normal stresses. Uh, of course, in plane stress, we are dealing with only the x and y faces as being subjected to, to stresses. So we have the X phase, yeah? And then we have the Y phase, the Y phase. The X phase is the phase that is perpendicular to the X axis. And the Y phase is the phase that is perpendicular to the Y axis. Then the Z phase would be, is the phase that is perpendicular to the Z axis. So for plain stress, we are dealing with the X phase and the Y phases only as, as the only phases subjected to stresses. 
So in that case, we have the normal stress. The normal stress sigma x y along the y direction. Uh, the sigma z z is zero in that approximate zero. This the x when in the notation sigma is normal stress, and then the x, the subscript x means the face, the face on which the stress acts. So when we say sigma x, we are meaning the normal stress on the x face. The normal stress on the x face. Uh, elsewhere, you will you will encounter that in some some books or some references. They use they use the double double subscript notation for the normal stresses. So it, uh, you find elsewhere the normal stress is, is denoted as sigma x x. So in that case, one the first subscript will uh, denotes the face, the face on which the stress acts. And the second subscript denotes denotes the denotes the direction direction of the stress. So, for this case, in that case, it would mean if if this on this element, if we had we we're using the notation sigma x x, it would mean that the normal stress sigma x is acting on the x space in the x direction. That's what it would mean. If it were sigma y y, it would be the normal stress sigma y y acts on the y face in the y direction. In the y direction, that is what it would mean. So you need to learn this notation. So in our work, we shall be using this uh, single subscript notation, not the double subscript notation. Okay, we could use it, uh, no problem, but. Uh, 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 just to uh, to just to, to make uh, maybe for to avoid having to type uh, double notation everywhere. Uh, we shall just be using a single subscript notation. She has pressed. She has pressed. So subscript like tau xy the first subscript denotes the face just like you have the normal stress the first subscript subscript like here the x here denotes the face on which the face sorry the, the face on which the stress acts and then the second subscript the y denotes the direction in which that stress acts so when we say tau xy we mean uh, the shear stress tau xy is acting on the x face of the element in the y direction. In the y direction. Okay. So another thing you need to note is the, the, the which direction, uh, because you can have a positive direction and a negative direction. And uh, so you, you have to note uh, that, that if the sign convention here for the direction, uh, like for shear stress, especially. Okay. For normal stress, sign convention is simple. Tension is positive, compression is negative, like before. But for shear stress, shear stress is said to be positive. We shall take it to be positive when it acts uh, either on the on the positive phase. First of all. On, on the element, this element, we have positive faces and negative faces, okay? If we orient our axis the way you see them as oriented on, on this element, the X axis is along towards the right, the Y axis is upwards, and the Z axis is uh, perpendicular to the face, sorry, to the plane, the plane on which this, uh, on, on, on the plane you're viewing right now. So, what is what is indicated here on those axes? Those directions are the positive direction of the axis. So, x axis is positive to the left and negative to the right. Y axis is positive to the positive upwards and negative downwards. And z axis is positive, perpendicular, uh, like moving away from the the wall or 
the, away from the, the, the your, your screen, okay, the, your computer screen, that is positive Z, and negative Z is into your computer screen. So, so we have the positive face and the negative face. The positive face are the faces that are perpendicular to the positive direction of each axis. So the positive X face here would be the perpendicular to the positive X, the opposite face. The opposite direction. The same applies to the y to the uh, positive y direction, and the negative y face is the face perpendicular to the negative y direction, like that. So that's how you denote the positive and the negative faces. So, so you need to know which face is positive and which face is negative, depending on how you have chosen to define them. For our case, this is how we are defining positive face and negative face, positive axis and negative axis. So, shear stress, shear stress is positive when it acts either on the positive face of an element, either on the positive face of one element in the positive direction, or on, or, or, or on the negative face, the negative face of the element in the negative direction. Okay, shear stress is positive, like tau xy is positive if it acts, uh, uh, if it acts on the positive face of the element in the positive direction. And also, if it were acting on the opposite face and, and it is positive shear, it means it is acting in the, in the neg on the negative face in the negative direction. So I don't know whether you get that. There was a question on that. Hello? I got it. Thank you. Okay. So, so you need to get that, that those notations and sign conventions. They are very important. So that's what we'll be using throughout throughout the, the following analysis. So like if negative, negative is positive. So if I get I'm on the negative face, I'm I'm in the positive direction, does that mean my shear stress is going to be negative? Exactly. If you're on the negative face and the shear stress is acting in the positive direction, that means that means negative shear. And if it is on the positive face but it's acting in the negative direction, that is negative shear. That is negative shear stress. That is how you represent it. So at the end, you'll have a problem, you're given a state of stress at a particular point, and you, you need to first represent that state of stress. A state of stress, like you're given the values of sigma x at a particular point in a structure or in a body, you're given the value of sigma x, sigma x, you're given sigma y, and you're given tau xy. And, uh, numerical values uh, you first you have you should be able to represent that state of stress on a stress element by making use of this this convention here yeah, this sign convention here yeah. so you know if you're given a shear stress as negative you know uh, and maybe tau xy is equal to negative two so you know tau xy means shear stress on the x space in the y direction so the negative two means it's acting in the shear stress as acting downwards on the x on the on the on the uh, on the x space acting downwards. So you that is how you'll be solving these problems. And also after carrying out your analysis, uh, uh, computing the stresses on an inclined section. Uh, also, you, you have to be able to represent the state of stress at uh, that uh, for that orientation for that uh, orientation of the of, of the of the element. 
you, should, you have to be able to represent a state of stress in using a, a stress element. Also, also, that makes use of this notation and convention. Okay. So, any other question? Uh, Ocheng, Ronald, you have your hand up. Uh, so, that means that the direction of, I mean, the, the, the sign on the shear force depends only on its direction, no matter the face. Hello? No, these traces act on it. Yes? Uh, these traces act on faces or they act on, on a particular. They act on some faces, some surfaces. Uh, both uh, the direction, the direction, of course, the direction. Uh, first, you have to know on which face, on which face the earth is traces is acting, on which face. So what, once you've got in the face on which it acts, the next thing is in what direction? It could be acting in a positive direction or the negative direction. So depending on the numerical value. Hmm. So, yeah. So both matter, the, the face and the direction matter. So okay, what I wanted to know is what final value do you assign? The, you like mean for example like okay okay i think i've got your question i've got your question what you're saying now if you make use of this convention and let's say let's say uh let me say that the stress is the shear stress is negative two right shear stress of negative two uh, let me try to represent it here uh let me say this is uh the stress element, I'm going to draw it here. This is a stress element. And? Yes, and we have the shear stress of negative two. Negative two means that, means that, that is tau xy. Tau xy is negative two. Okay, so that means we have to represent we have a stress, a shear stress on the x face. This would be the x face. Now, this element, this two dimensional element. Okay. Where you think of it, you have it in. So that would mean, let's say we have here, this is representing negative two here. Uh, can you see this on the top right hand corner? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have negative two there. And, uh, uh okay let's say that is negative two megapascal the units of stress are megapascals negative two megapascals like that sorry two megapascals okay if, if let's say tau x y is tau x y is equal to negative two that's what we are given negative two mega pascal and we need to represent it your question is uh what happens with the sign so if you make use of this convention uh negative two means that tau x y on the x face positive x face is acting downwards on that face so we represent it as downwards acting downwards here so to put the numerical values you simply just you don't need to indicate the sign anymore all you do is the magnitude is what you represent yeah what you represent just like you deal with forces the sign of a sign of a force so that's how you represent a shear negative two on that on that face of the element it would simply be two because the direction already tells you that it's negative if you're to keep the negative just just like you do for for forces yeah if you keep the negative then it means you're going to to represent it as acting upward but then the the, the negative two will tell you the actual direction and it will tell you that, that 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 stress is negative like that so is that what you were asking again yes yes sir. yeah so so once you uh you can either way is okay either way you, you represent it as negative two 
but uh, acting in a positive uh, in the positive direction. The negative too will tell you that uh, in the true direction is downward, should be downward. Or represent it as I've shown in the uh, uh, before, uh, as acting downward, and then indicate the magnitude of the shear force in the element. Sorry, shear stress, not shear force. Okay, any other question? No, 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 no. Okay, no other hands up. Okay. So you need to, this is about the notation. So now next uh, is how to uh, uh, stresses on an inclined section. Okay. Stresses on an inclined section. So uh, in most cases, in the problems you'll be dealing with, you'll be given a state of stress at a particular point. In other words, you'll be given numerical values for sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy at a particular point. And then at that same point, you will be required to compute the state of stress along an axis, along axis, uh, an axis that is oriented at a certain angle from the original axis, like what would be the state of stress if we rotated, if we rotated this element here, we rotated it by uh, a certain angle, yeah? The state, the stresses will not be the same, okay? What is given, what will be given typically, like it will be the state of stress, like the way uh, along this X and Y axis, and to call this the X, Y plane. Yeah, the state of stress in this X, Y plane. What would happen if we, if we rotated the axis, maybe by a certain angle, like that? Would these stresses be the same? Would they be the same or not? So, uh, formula for computing the, state, the stresses. Uh, on this, that now this become new axis after the rotation through a certain angle, either clockwise or counterclockwise, we get new axis, okay, which uh, which which is denoted here as the x one axis and then the y one axis, x one axis and the y one axis. So we get new axis. So the, the so we are now interested in what what is the normal stress along the, the x1 axis and what is the normal stress along the y1 axis and what are the shear stresses on the faces of that element oriented at that but uh, oriented along the, the x1 and y1 axis so what is tau x1 y1 so that would be the question those would be the questions to answer so to to do that you need to uh you use some equations, equations which we shall derive, and then we will be able to use those equations. They are trigonomet trigonometric equations. So uh, we'll use them, and then you'll be able to obtain sigma x1, sigma y1. That, those are the normal stresses along the x1 and the y1 directions. And also, you'll use a certain equation to compute the shear stress, the shear stress tau x1, y1. So, and then you'll be able to tell whether or not the stresses, uh, you get a different set of stresses after orienting the element, uh, after rotating the element by a certain angle. So generally you, the stresses will not be the same. Any small change in the, any ori any small orientation of the of the stress from the original from the original position or from the original state uh, will result into a new set of stresses. Any small change in orientation will, will, will result into a new change, a new state of stress. So you can see there are some there's an infinite set of stresses that you can that you can have. There's an infinite set of stresses because you can orient orient this element by any angle, any angle, any angle, any angle. And then each time you orient it, you have to compute the normal stresses and the shear stresses. Every time you, you, you rotate it, let's say every time you rotate it, 
compute the normal stresses and the shear stresses like that like that like that so why 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 are you doing this you're doing this because you are looking for the maximum stresses you're investigating by how much should this element be oriented uh, by how much can you rotate this element to get the largest stress at the very point at the same point o so what will be the angle of rotation that will give the largest normal stress at that same point and the largest shear stress at the same uh, at the same point that is basically what analysis of stress and strain is about that is that, that's all there, there's there is nothing 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 so much really. so so that, that's what we'll be doing and i said like i said before there are two methods the first method is using equations you know, that is called the analytical method using equations and uh, the second method is using is a graphical method that makes use of Moore's circle, Moore's circle to do the same thing. Okay. So, so yeah. So, uh, so first we need to derive equations for computing stresses on an inclined, an inclined section. Okay. So we start with this state of stress. We are given a state of stress. It can be it can be given as as it is on the left side on this left left hand side element or the state of stress can also be given in this form like the like on the right hand or right hand element either way it's okay yeah? don't take it that the state of stress, the state of stress will always be uh, like, like on the left hand element the element on the left here. it can be you can be given an oriented oriented element and then you're given the stresses on that element and then you need to compute the, the maximum or the, the maximum stresses the maximum normal stress and maximum shear stress so it, uh, all in all you just make use of the equations or make use of the graph the more circle to to compute the maximum shear and normal stresses okay so now to derive those equations, uh, I think I don't think we are going to complete that today. Okay. Okay. So we have yeah. So to derive that, we shall we shall we shall look at we shall consider a wedge shaped element. Now this one is this wedge shaped element has some of the faces perpendicular to the original x uh, the original uh, x axis and the y axis and then another face is inclined at an angle theta the same angle at which at which uh, we we rotated this axis x y to a new uh, to new to, to, to new positions or to new axis x1 y1 so this is this this is after rotating uh, the axis in a clockwise direction by an angle theta to get to x1 y1 now we can represent this this uh, this this condition here using uh, a wedge a wedge a wedge like this so either way uh because we are going to have to resolve forces we are going to have to resolve forces so we can do it with this state with this orientation we can do it but if we do it this way we will have to deal with so many so many forces so many forces but we shall arrive at the same answer so to simplify the work here we just simply represent Mm, the orientation by just the inclined face of a wedge yeah the face of a wedge inclined at an angle theta to the vertical and then this simplifies the work because uh by we shall this takes us to the same answer uh, uh as when if we use this uh, this condition at uh, this state here so to simplify the working we, we consider this wedge shaped element whose faces two faces are, are 
uh, uh, oriented the same as in the same direction as the x and y, and then it has one face inclined at the same angle theta to the y axis. So, so we represent so on the inclined face, on the inclined face, the normal stress is sigma x one, and then we have the shear stresses, the shear stress tau x1, y1. And of course, uh, we, we can also represent the axis uh, along the perpendicular to the inclined face, we have the x1 axis, and then parallel to that inclined face, we have the y1 axis. So this one will simplify our derivation. Okay, we we'll simplify, we won't have to work with very lengthy equations when uh, resolving the forces here. So the next thing we are going to do is to resolve forces. Resolve forces and, uh, and find an expression for sigma x1 and tau x1 y1, as simple as that. That's all we have to do. So to first resolve the forces, before, before we resolve the forces, we have to draw the free body diagram, the free body diagram. Okay, now this state of this stress here, we are, we are working with this simplified mm, two dimensional state of stress. It is two dimensional, but it has a thickness. You have to remember that it has a thickness. Okay, so the thickness is small, but we have it, we have a thickness. So here on the left, to come to this slide here, on the left, we have stresses. Stresses acting on each of the three faces. And then on the right, we have the forces. Forces, now these are forces because we resolve forces, not stresses. So first, with these stresses that, uh, that are represented on this wedge, uh, on this wedge, we can compute the forces. You know, force is stress times area. So we denote this area here by uh, this, this space, the vertical face of the wedge, we denote it that we, we, we can call that the area of that face is A naught. Okay, this is A, A naught. The area of that face, the face parallel to the y axis. This is the area, we denote it as A. So if we denote it as A, A naught, sorry, A naught like that that is the area of that face so then we can compute the normal stress on that face sorry the normal force in that face which is simply stress times area so the normal force the normal force on this face which is actually the, the negative x space the normal force is sigma x times a naught stress times the area and the shear stress would be tau x y times a naught as indicated here, okay? Then do the same for the other faces. So you have to resolve, resolve, do resolution, resolution, and then compute this, the forces on the other faces in terms of A naught, in terms of A naught, and the, and, and, and the stresses acting on the, on the respective face. So for the bottom face, we have the normal stress would be sigma y. Now this is trigonometry. This is trigonometry. We are resolving, getting components of A naught. So it, uh, for this space, the area of this space would be A naught times tan theta. Okay, the area of this bottom face. Remember it has a thickness. The thickness is into, into the screen that you're viewing. It has a thickness that goes into the, the screen that you're viewing. So we have an area, it's not just a line. It's not just a line, there is a thickness. So uh, if it's, uh, we have a thickness, so we have an area, it's actually a surface, it's more surface. So the area of that surface, the bottom is A naught times tan theta to do your, your trigonometry here. A naught tan theta, that is the area, times the stress, which is sigma y, to give us the force, to give us the force, sigma y times A naught times tan theta. So do the same for the shear stress, sorry, for the shear force, the shear force would be 
uh, the shear stress, which is tau y x. Yeah, this the shear stress time moves the same area, a not tan theta. Okay, and then you do the same for 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 the inclined face. The area of the inclined face is a not time moves sec theta. If you resolve a not along the incline, it becomes a not sec theta. And then the stresses, uh, the normal stress is sigma x1 times a naught sec theta and tau x1 y1 times a naught sec theta. So that is how you you would obtain the forces on each of the three faces like that. Uh, I had not yet included those, those uh, resolutions. Are not yet included, but I'll update. I'll update. I'll add more slides with this to include all those uh, resolution uh, for you. So after that, then you can now resolve because now you have forces on the free body diagram. This now becomes a free body diagram indicating the forces. Okay, here, yeah. and then then you can now resolve forces. You can now resolve forces. The, the task here. The task here is to make sigma x1 the subject and tau x1 y1 the subject. So make sigma x1 the subject and tau x1 y1 the subject. The result will be uh, an equation that, uh, that you can use to compute the normal stress along x1 and along and the shear stress along y1. Just like that. Okay, how is it? Any questions? I'm not I'll add the equations, not for them. I will yes. Shall we rotate that thing in clockwise direction, not anti-clockwise direction? And show me the possible unit. Uh sorry, you were not so clear. You repeat again. I'm like let us choose the that we should in the just like the force that we are on it. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I'm not, I'm not picking up the lead. Can you, can you type the question? I typed it. I'm not getting you clearly. The, 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 the network is not. You try to type it. Okay, so where is this chat? As we move. Uh huh. Okay, yes. As we move on. As we move on. We are supposed oh. to be moving to the next lecture. I think it's ICT. Okay, now, yeah, I, I wanted us to continue with ICT from midday up to one, the many one hour. So uh, I think we will have to stop. Yes. Let's continue. We'll have to stop here for strength of material. This one is out of control. This one is out of control. Uh, no. Let me first stop screen share and uh, Mr. Felix. Yes, please. I, I was see. requesting, could you share with a PowerPoint presentation because we don't have it. I will send it to you, uh, but uh, I need to make some. Uh, I need to, uh, some content. I need to add. I send it to add uh, on these equations we are talking about. I have first. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I'm seeing some weird comments, uh, um, weird interactions in the in, in the in the chat. Uh, no, we are uh, no 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 no. 
uh, I'm going to I'm going to penalize whoever puts anything that is out of context. Okay. If you know you're you 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 you're, you're talking about things that are out of context, I'm going to penalize you for that. And this is not the forum. This is not the forum for for those discussions. I'm very sorry, sir. Oh. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, this, I uh, think, uh, let's stop here for strength of material. We shall continue and complete it. I'll uh, I'll make improve on these slides and then forward them to you. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a break of five minutes, and then we we switch over to ICT two. Thank <laughs> you. 